Well, hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you from Vitality Stadium. We're here to bring you much closer to some of the personalities connected to the club and we've got an exciting one coming up for you today. For those who normally tune in, you might be wondering where our regular presenter Chris Temple is. Well, he's currently away on international duty at the Euros. No, not playing, but as Wembley's official stadium announcer. That means you're stuck with me, Zoe Rundle, part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. Now, I hope you'll be pleased to hear that that's the only substitution for today's podcast. It's club journalist and Bournemouth expert Neil Perrett is alongside me. Neil, it's great to have you, but a lot has changed since you last sat down to record a podcast. We've had new management come in. We've seen England unite a nation in the Euros and you've even downloaded TikTok onto your phone. Not only that, Zoe, I've actually managed to download it twice by mistake. And my nieces had uh, a lot of laughter in pointing that out to me when I saw it. Yeah, you're right. A lot certainly has happened, but that's football. Uh, that's the way things go, you know, um, new manager, like you said, the Euros are in full flow. It's, it's almost been non-stop since, since the end of last season. Time to crack on with the more serious stuff, Zoe. We've got a superb guest on the show. As you know, we try to encompass people from all over the club with these podcasts. Uh, we've got one of our new members of staff who's kindly agreed to take time out of his busy pre-season schedule to talk to us. He's had experience of working at Spurs and Fulham and now finds himself on the South Coast as a member of Scott Parker's backroom staff here. It's fantastic to be able to welcome Matt Wells here. Matt is our new assistant head coach. Matt, thanks very much for joining us. Nice, no, a pleasure. Good to be here. Right, I'm going to give you an easy one to start with, <laughs> Matt. So I'm going to start my stopwatch and I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to Cherry's fans. I'm going to give you 30 seconds from now. Oh, 30 seconds. Um, I'm not sure I'm interested enough to speak for that long, but as you said, so come in now with Scott as the uh, assistant head coach. Um, obviously, previously at Fulham with Scott. Before that, I was uh, at Tottenham with Scott. Started my coaching journey long before that, working through Tottenham's younger age groups at Stevenage for a little while, the Nike Academy, a brief stint in the USA. And then obviously fortunate to, to meet Scott and, and now we're at the, the next stop of our journey at Bournemouth. You seem to have done an awful lot and you don't look that old. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a, a, a lot compressed into a, a short number of years, I guess. Um, obviously, unfortunately, I'm sure we'll come to it, but my playing career was, was cut a little bit short at the age of 20, so I'm 32 now, so I've had 12 years of, of coaching and in that time I've, I've managed to, to experience a lot and, and different environments, different cultures and, and, that, and now we're here, which is really exciting. Let's go right back to the start of that footballing journey for you. Nine years old when you first joined Tottenham. How did that all come about for you? It was a strange one, really. I was just playing for, for my local team uh, in Ware, um, so Ware Town. And Mickey Hazard, the ex-Tottenham player, just happened to, to be there at a game and he was working at Tottenham. Um, and he asked me after the game to, um, through my parents to, to come to his soccer school that he used to run on a, a Friday night in the community. And I went to that and one one session later, he invited me to, to Tottenham uh, for a six week trial. And after one week, he, he signed me to uh, to the academy. And and that was how it all began under under Mickey's tutelage and, and then went right through the system. Tell us about some of the players that you would have progressed through the ranks with there. And did you ever cross paths with Adam Smith? I did actually, yeah, I did. I did. Adam was a little bit younger than me, obviously, um, but somehow we did manage actually, or end up playing a couple of games together, um, and so that probably speaks more for Adam than my ability because I think he was about four years younger or three years younger than me. So I'm not quite sure how many age groups I was playing down or how many he was playing up. Um, and then in terms of other players, obviously it was a, it's, a, it's a top academy, so a lot of talented players came through, I'd say in the period when I was there, it maybe wasn't at its best. Uh, and then John McDermott came in in my first year as a scholar and he sort of transformed the approach of the academy. And that's when you then saw a conveyor belt really of successful players come through. So I'm f I think I missed the boat a, a little bit. Um, probably the most successful graduate um, was Mark Wright, <laughs> who went on to be in the only way as Essex. So I think he was the biggest success story at the time. There weren't many top players, but a lot of good, a lot of Good um, league players came through um, from my age group, the likes of Jack Magoma, Simon Dawkins, all had good good league career. David Button in goal, um, so there was some there were some good solid players there at the time. You talked about some of the players that you've played alongside and those that you came through the ranks with. You touched on John McDermott. Tell us about some of the other coaches that you would have played under and, and who you, who you learned off. Yeah, it was probably like um, 
Mickey Hazard was probably important for me, bizarrely, in terms of my coaching, um, as, as strange as it seems, obviously being that I met Mickey when I was nine and 10 years old and played under him then. But I think you can never be sure, but I think he sort of opened my eyes to a particular way of playing football that ended up um, shaping my coaching career, obviously a number of years down the line. Um, so I think Mickey was, was really important for my journey at that time. And then much later on, once I went full time, I was really fortunate to have John McDermott, who's obviously probably the top player developer in the country in terms of individual player development of young players. So I learned a lot from him. And then Alex Inglethorpe came in as well, who obviously is now at, at Liverpool. And Alex was a, a big influence at the real, when I first started coaching and made the transition from player to coach. He was really good with me and very supportive. And I was in with the under 18s, um, shadowing Al on a daily basis. And, and that was a really good learning curve. So probably between Alex and John, really important figures for me. As a coach yourself now, do you ever keep in touch with any of those people? Yeah, I do. I spoke to Alex a couple of days ago. Um, obviously Alex, well, football's a small world. So Alex had employed Gary O'Neill um, as one of his coaches. And obviously now it ends that I'm working alongside Gary. So, um, I was scheduled to speak to Alex anyway, but obviously Gary was was one of the subjects we discussed. And and then also I'm probably lucky and the same with the gaffer that uh, because of our backgrounds coming through youth systems, we've got great contacts at the likes of Man United, Tottenham, Liverpool. So that will hopefully help us attract young players if we need to do so in the future. You spoke about, you know, the gaffer there and we'll come on to that a little bit later on. But going back to Spurs, you spent 11 years there, but injuries scuppered your chances of making it as a professional footballer. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I would say it was, again, I think at the time, obviously football's developed a lot and progressed a lot. And I think at the time, potentially um, the sports science programme wasn't where, certainly where it is now um, with the knowledge and the, the programming, the periodization of your work. So perhaps I came through a full-time schedule where it was maybe a little bit too demanding for what my body could tolerate um, at the time. But obviously a lot of other players did come through. So um, perhaps I was just never destined to uh, to survive the rigours of first team football. But I was a very good young player um, in terms of sort of my belief in myself and my reputation at the time from nines to sixteens. But it just so happened once I went full-time for numerous reasons, I just couldn't stay fit. And I've probably got more recollections of the of the treatment room than, than the actual pitch, which is disappointing, but um, it's led me to where I am now, so. And when that playing career came to an end, was it quite a natural step into coaching for you? When did you realise that you wanted to go into coaching? I think I was always, I wouldn't say it was a conscious choice to go into coaching, but I was always aware that I was much more interested in uh, the game than what other players my age were, who just sort of liked to rock up to training, do the session, generally moan about the session and then go home, um, which might be a typical trait of, of some players. Whereas I was bizarrely, and I don't know why, a lot more interested in the intricacies of why are we doing what we're doing? How are the coaches going about it? Uh, I was always naturally, maybe because of the position I played holding midfield, I saw myself as the, the brains of the team. So I like to think about the strategic side of the game and not understand where the spaces were on the pitch. So I had a real, deeper interest in football than maybe what a lot of my um, peers did. So I always knew that it might be an option. And then obviously my career ended a lot sooner than, than I had anticipated. And then it felt like a, a natural progression from there. Where did that interest stem from at such a young age? I mean, you must have been coaching people a lot older than you as well. Yeah, I think I think it's really difficult to, to, to pinpoint. I think with any, obviously I worked in development for a number of years. So I, I was always a big believer that as a young player, you, something needs to ignite your interest in something, um, but you can never really pinpoint what that moment is. And I say, I've got a hunch that Mickey's, Mickey Hazard's, um, the way that he coached me, the way that he convinced me to see the game uh, on a deeper level, the way he believed in the passing game. And he always used to transmit that to us as players. Um, but why I took more of an interest in it than maybe some of the other lads, I'm not quite so sure. And then I think that that sort of interest in the game just fostered over a number of years. And by the time I was 19, 20 years old, um, I was studying the game. I was used to record training sessions. Um, which probably isn't a normal trait of, of a young footballer at 18, 19. So, yeah, I'm not exactly sure where it came from, but I'm glad it did. And you got a qualification very young as well. 
Yeah, yeah, I did all my, I, I managed, again, because of my pathway and the disappointment of, of not making it a, as a player. Um, even, I guess, how I responded to that perhaps suggested to me that internally, I didn't have the desperation to become a player um, that some of the lads around me did. Um, and, and I managed to respond to it quite positively uh, and go into the coaching side pretty quickly. And I think aside from, you, there's one thing is your qualifications and I would say the next thing is your real footballing education. So for me, what was invaluable, of course, doing my B license at the time at a very young age was big, but working alongside and getting to watch Alex Inglethorpe, John McDermott, Chris Ramsey, all these guys that were operating at the top level, Ricardo Moniz, who was a Dutch skills coach, who was at, at Spurs and, and they just sort of ignited my interest in coaching. And, and that was the, the biggest qualification that anyone could have. Just want to ask you about a couple of family members of yours, one of whom the research was very easy to find that your grandfather was the Tottenham legend, Cliff Jones. Just tell us how influential he was, he's been with you. Yeah, massive. And again, this probably all is all, all links together. Um, because obviously I was immersed in football from from such a young age with with my granddad, as you said. Um, unfortunately, I was a little bit too young to to obviously witness uh, the delights of his career. But um, yeah, I've seen no no shortage of, of footage of of him playing and heard copious stories from him. Um, and we have a very close relationship, which is which is amazing. Um, so no, he's been really important for me in in, in sort of my footballing development. Uh, and I think the the passion that I have for football most likely stems from having a figure like that w within the family. And another one which wasn't quite so easy to find out about, and we're grateful to a, a long-term Cherry supporter, Keith Brewer, who tipped us off about this link. Your great uncle, Bryn Jones, was a tough tackling left back who made 131 appearances for the Cherries in, uh, in the late 50s, early 60s. Now, you were only two when Bryn passed away so um I imagine you don't probably know a great deal about him yeah I, I don't think I've ever I've ever met Bryn but um obviously through through my granddad Cliff uh and obviously my family as well I've heard uh, a lot of stories about him and um again I think that that does contribute to the influence of, of football in my life uh, I think it's funny that Obviously, everywhere I go at the moment, there seems to be links. Obviously, I went from Tottenham, where there was a huge link to my granddad, to then I moved to Fulham, which is the exact move my granddad made as a player when he was transferred from Tottenham to Fulham. Um, and now I've come to Bournemouth and obviously the connection with Bryn. So, yeah, it's clear, clearly quite a, um, a footballing family. At his unveiling press conference, Scott Parker said that this club was the perfect fit for him. Now, is it fair to say that Scott is the perfect fit for you in terms of your coaching? Yeah, def definitely. I think I think the type of person that the the gaffer is, I've, I think he'd be a, the perfect fit for anyone as a in, in my position as a first team coach. And obviously, I met Scott um, when when he first came in to to do the under 18s at, at Tottenham. I had been with the 23s, but John McDermott moved me to work alongside Scott as he as he envisioned it being a, a good fit, which was clearly a, a good choice. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a match made in heaven, really, because Scott had just finished his his illustrious playing career, uh, came in with um, a great vision and some really exciting ideas about how the game should be played. And it just so happened that we both had such in common. As soon as we had the first discussion, it was clear that um, our vision for the game w was a perfect match. So I think we both really helped each other in those initial phases because I was maybe able to translate a lot of Scott's ideas to the pitch with the players because of my coaching background. Um, and Scott gave me a new lease of life in terms of uh, the extreme nature of, of and how strong he was with his philosophy and vision for the game. Have you had any good arguments with him about things? Uh, we, have, we have lots and I think that's probably the... I would say the biggest strength of us as a staff, and I'm sure maybe we'll come on to some of the other members of staff as well, but um, we have a lot of confrontation. Uh, and I think every healthy environment that strives to to be elite, which is the biggest principle of the gaffer, is that wherever we go, he wants it to be world-class. Um, and there'll never be a moment where, no matter the success, whether it was obviously getting promoted in his first season at Fulham, still at the end of that season, he wasn't content. and not just with all areas of the club, but the football inside as well. 
Um, there was no real celebration other than the night of the promotion. It was then, okay, we need to do this better. We can improve here. It was a big staff meeting. Uh, he's amazing at giving every member of staff a voice. Uh, and as a result, we all have ownership and we all feel real responsibility in our area of work. Uh, and I think we're all brave. We see criticism um, as, a, as a, a necessary vehicle to, to move forward. And, and I think we'll always operate that way, which is, which is really healthy. He's your boss. Is he sort of like a good mate as well? I'd say we're 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 really good friends. You know, we we go on holiday together, and um, so no, we're we're very close, and 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 that side of it obviously makes. Uh, I think it helps because it makes the good times e even better, and it makes, of course, in football there's a a lot of down times and there's a lot of stress, and I think if you didn't have that close relationship, it, it could be difficult. Um, so I think it really helps us, and I think as I just said, the the fact that we're that there's such a uh, psychological safety, I guess, between the two of us with our relationship that we are able to be really blunt with each other. He can with some of my coaching sessions, he can be particularly blunt with, no, it needs to be more like this. And then in other areas, I'm, I have a voice to say to him, look, we need to improve here. We can do this better. And we never take it personally. It's all about improving and, and giving the best program we can to the players. Speaking of having a voice, you seem to have a very active role on the training pitch. You know, we see you out there on the Vitality Stadium pitch, out on the training ground. Sometimes a second in command can take a little bit more of a backseat, but that doesn't seem to be the case with you. Yeah, again, I guess it comes back to, um, I'd say one of the, the, the manager's biggest traits, and he's got quite a few, so probably not enough to, to list in this podcast, but one of his biggest traits in terms of the staff working for him is that we're all empowered. Um, and he gives Ali Harris a huge amount of responsibility in terms of the physical programming. Um, he gives me a huge responsibility in terms of devising and delivering the training program. He gives Birchie exactly the same with the goalkeeping, Jonathan Hill, Charlie, the, the guys that came in with us. I think everyone feels uh, a massive responsibility and ownership to, to work in the way that they, they see fit. Um, of course, all fitting within delivering Scott's philosophy that he wants delivered. And we, we know him so well now that we, we, we know what that is. We know the, the mentality side of things. Um, so I think it probably all just stems from that, really. Uh, of course, with that comes, comes great responsibility. Um, so I think we all touch wood. I'd like to think we've all got very good work ethics and we're just here to try and deliver the best programme we can. Do you relish that responsibility? Because obviously he's putting a lot of faith and a lot of trust in you and, and a lot of pressure as well, because if you're in charge of sessions and, you know, Rob's in charge of the goalkeeper sessions, it's a, a lot of faith being put in you. Yeah, I think so. I think it, it probably all comes down to what type of personality you are. I think I respond personally, I don't really speak for myself, I respond really well to that because um, it's a privilege for, for the gaffer to put that amount of trust in us and, and the staff. Um, and then also... I tend not to think about it because really my main focus um, is, okay, we, we, we come here, say, with, we do have a very, uh, I'll use the word strict, I guess, very strict philosophy and very, can be complex way of playing. Um, and it's about just trying to deliver that the, the best, in the best way we can to help the players understanding of exactly what we want. So my focus every day is just, Okay, where do it's like a jigsaw puzzle, I guess. Where do where do we have to fit each piece within the physical periodization? So, say for instance, today um, was probably our first lighter day in terms of the workload, so we can go a little bit more in terms of a tactical nature of the work. Um, whereas, for instance, uh, two days ago we had our first intensive work, so it's work. Okay, what what outcomes within the physical outcomes can we fit on each day? Um, so I really enjoy the challenge of the I call it the preseason puzzle of trying to fit in the right pieces at the right times to, to help the players produce the best performance they can in six weeks' time. And for you yourself, would you ever fancy a, a crack at being a head coach or are you quite happy sort of, you know, working under someone and working towards that philosophy? It's never something I've, I've thought about, to be honest. I think probably my my strength and skill set lies in the strategic side of the game, the, the delivering of, of training sessions. Um, and I'm working for the gaffer and that's probably what I get the most pleasure out of. So my aim and goal and my ambition is to become a specialist in terms of being an assistant head coach uh, with this manager. And I'm, I'm far from that yet. So I need to keep working at that. 
you've mentioned a couple of the other coaches that Scott's brought in. We'll start with the ones on the training pitch. We've got Rob Batch, the, the goalkeeper coach, and, and we've got Jonathan Hill, our analyst. Just tell us a bit more about them to start with. Yeah, so, so Rob, um, probably a similar background to myself, came through the academy at Tottenham. Um, made the leap to first team football that I failed to make um, and played sort of a number of different clubs and had a really solid career in in uh, sort of the lower leagues of football. And then probably similar to myself, when he finished playing, um, he also had his injury troubles. And then I think probably through me and there's another lad called Kieran McKenna, who's a close friend of ours that is now the first team coach. Uh, Man United, and I think we were all, we were all close friends as as young players, um, and I think probably Rob saw that me and Kieran had gone off on our coaching journeys, and he then started his and and sort of did did his hard yards at Tottenham through the academy over a number of years, went to England, uh, and then fortunately we were able to poach him and and take him to Fulham when we went there, and that was sort of the beginning of our journey as a team working together. And then you've got Ali Harris, Charlie Moore, more on the, the performance side of things and the sports science side of things. Just explain a bit more about their roles. Yeah, so so um, sorry, I forgot to mention John Hill. So obviously John, analysis-wise, worked with me closely at Tottenham uh, with, with the under-18s programme and with the gaffer for that one year. Um, so very, very good in terms of the analysis side of things. So again, he was a big coup for us at Fulham. And then Ali, obviously slightly different. Ali, we met at Fulham. And he was delivering uh, the sort of performance program there in terms of planning, training, and the physical, the physical side of things, which is where he specialises. Um, and then it was only last season where we we tried to again, like I said, the gaffer's always looking for where can we improve. And one of the areas we felt was was in terms of the the gym program. Um, and so we just tried to seek, let's go and find the best the best in the country, which we felt was was Charlie. Um, who happened to be working with Tottenham's first team at the time. And um, I think, again, it speaks volumes for, for the gaffer's vision that we were able to attract to Fulham um, someone of Charlie's calibre who was working with Tottenham's first team. So thankfully, Charlie's joined the team now and I think we've got a really, really good team. When you see the likes of Charlie and Ali work, you mentioned a little bit earlier on that when you were coming through the ranks, the sports science side of things, mm -hmm wasn't quite there and it wasn't up to the standard it is now. What are the differences, you know, when you see those two work and the, the rest of the sports science department compared to when you were starting out all those years ago? I think it's probably the, the biggest step is, which is now well documented in, in football, is probably just the periodization of, of the training. So in real simple terms is when do we, on what days do we push them? How do we push them? And then on what days do we need to, to come off them? And I think when I was a young player coming through, I don't think there was quite that approach. It was push him every single day, regardless of the context of the week, regardless of has he played a game, hasn't he played a game, when's the next fixture. Um, so I think that's where, and then certainly the, the the work you do in the gym, I think before it was maybe a one size fits all approach. Whereas now uh, I'd say in the real elite football programs is, is extremely individualized. Um, so within the team context, um, Every player's got their individual programming in the gym and even to some degree their physical work that they do on the pitch. So I think that's where Ali and Charlie excel. And I think obviously the us, that then has to fit within the context of how are we going to play? So that's then down to me and the gaffer to give extreme clarity to them guys around the game model, exactly how we're going to play in and out of possession and in the transition moments. Um, and then they can tie the physical into that. And so hopefully by the time you arrive on Saturday when you're playing your game, um, the team's perfectly conditioned and raring to go in that moment. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask you about interests outside of football. I know you probably haven't got a great deal of time for, for anything, but is it like golf or I don't, horse race? I don't know, anything. What do you do? <laughs> I would give a really boring, it's, it's, it is football to be honest, it's, you're, you're fully immersed in it and of course I love, love spending time with, with family and um, as I say I'm recently engaged, um, well a year ago now and then we've got the wedding next, next summer in June so um, I couldn't really sit here and pretend I've, I've had much involvement with the planning of the wedding so Lauren's taken the lead on that but other than that yeah it's football, I'm obviously a huge sports fan, anything around elite sports and um, you know, I like to the the small amount of time I do have. I like to try and dedicate that to to self development. Because as you said earlier, I'm 32 years old. Okay, I've been coaching 12 years, but 
Um, I, I want to become the, the best version of myself that I can be. So read a lot of books, watch a lot of programs and listen to a lot of podcasts. So um, yeah, a lot of time spent around that. If you could swap places with any other sports person and be them, Oof. alive or dead, who, who would that be? God, that's, that is difficult. Yeah, I've got no real good answer for that, to be honest. I don't, I know it sounds really boring, but I don't think of it in that way. I think you become so focused on your own development and the, and the own ro your sort of role you're playing within your own small team that we've got here, that I just sort of dedicate all of my energy that I've got to just, let's try and improve. Where can I get better? I think I've managed to develop a good sense of, of healthy criticism and being quite self-aware. So always just try and push myself to, Come on, what can we do better? How can how can I become a better coach? How can I deliver a better training program? What elements of the philosophy did we not manage to get across in the last couple of years um, in sort of our first stint in first team football? And then just work from there. Not been here a fortnight yet. I've spoken to one of the players and done a piece with him. He said it's the hardest first week of pre-season he's <laughs> ever had. What do you think about when you hear that? It's tough. I think it's w where we pitch it. We, we come here with, a, a very, as I said, a, a clear philosophy around how we're going to play, how we're going to try and dominate games. And, and to do that, aside from the tactical side of the game, in and out of possession, we, we need to be the fittest team in the league. And um, that's a belief we carry. So there's no other, to, to arrive at the end of that journey of, of achieving that, there is no other way than to work hard. Um, that player, whoever it was, probably wouldn't be happy to hear that we actually adapted the program last week on about day four. Uh, we came off the players and, and probably the plan that we had devised, we decided that it wasn't quite, it was maybe pitched a little bit too high. Because um, of course, pre-season is always a balance of pushing the players, creating the mentality to work hard, but you want to keep every player on the pitch and out of the treatment room. Um, so we actually saw the first week as easier than what we had aimed for initially. Um, but of course, like any good program, you have to adapt and um, feel the energy of the group and we felt it appropriate to just come off them but the work will get harder now in the next week so <laughs> maybe interview him again after that one to, to be fair he did say that we we have worked hard to get where we are in our career so we we are here to work hard so it wasn't a, a sort no, of complaint no, no. or anything yeah. like that it was it's our job yeah. you know and, and they know that they get well paid for it and, and stuff like that now it must have been difficult for you with the timing of everything planning for a pre-season because I would imagine you were probably planning for a pre-season somewhere else and now you're planning for a pre-season here. And it started virtually the day after you all came in. How difficult was that for you? Yeah, listen, it's, in terms of an, a utopia and an ideal preparation, it, it obviously wasn't that, but um, not that you would ever have complaints because we're joining a, uh, an incredible organisation um, already in the first... As soon as we arrived here to sign the contracts and, and we had discussions with with the staff, with Richard, um, it was it was clear to us that this is, I think Scott alluded to it in his first press conference, that suddenly we felt aligned in terms of uh, Scott's vision, the vision of the club, that this is a long-term project, um, that we all need to trust in, we need to trust in them, they need to trust in us, the way that we work. So I think the excitement for the challenge ahead of us far outweighs any complaints you could have about ideal preparation, um, I think in terms of Ali, in terms of Charlie, in terms of uh, myself having the, the football programme in, in, in place anyway, um, of course, the, the geography of where we're de now delivering it had changed, but, uh, and then we made a f uh, some small adaptions to it, but um, no, we were fully prepared to, to deliver the work that we, we want to deliver. And um, of course, we had experience of previous pre-seasons that we could draw on. So we're really happy with the plan that we've landed on. And as I say, we adapt that each week as we go. Following on from what Neil was saying, for you, obviously Scott's come in here and you know he's seen what's here already. He's spoken about getting you guys. And for you, was it always a given that if Scott could go, he would take you with him? Is that conversations that you'd had before? Or was it, look, I've been offered this head coach position at Bournemouth. 
I would like you to come with me. How how does the dynamic sort of work in that situation? I think probably the only guarantee was, is from my direction that um, if the opportunity is there to go with the gaffer, I, I would go. I would go wherever he wanted to take me. <laughs> um, so obviously I wouldn't want to speak for him. I'd like to think that wherever he goes, he would he would want me to come with him because as we say, we've got such a close relationship, um, both personally and and in the sort of on and off the pitch in a, in a working sense as well. So. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to say concretely in case it came back to bite me, um, but definitely from from my perspective, I think aside from my passion in football, um, I'm sort of, for want of a better phrase, attracted to the gaffer's vision for the game and um, and sort of his his motivation and uh, the way he excites all of us as a staff. I think we, we'd all say the same if you asked us that we'd we'd follow him wherever he wants to take us. So, touch wood. And that must speak volumes for him, you know, because if, you know, you're you're so keen to come with him, it says a lot about his managerial skills of his staff, let alone the players. And obviously it's him working on the training ground, trying to get the best out of the players. But also for you, he's got to manage his staff and you, you do certainly seem like a very tight unit. Would that be fair to say? I'd say we're really tight and I think you, you have to be. Um, I was lucky enough to observe Pochettino's regime at Tottenham very closely. And I think that was the one thing that stood out to me there was... Um, the tightness of the staff. And I think that's really important in football and in any elite organisation that we've got a little phrase that there can be no gaps. And I think sometimes um, players will tend to uh, try and exploit certain gaps. And if they find that within the staff and that's to the detriment of your programme. So I think because we are so tight in terms of uh, the respect we have for each other, but also um, I feel that our program is 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 very very tight, and there's no hiding spaces within it. Um, I feel like it just gives real clarity to the players. They know, hopefully, it's clear already to them. They know how we operate. They know our expectations, and as long as they fit within that, um, then they'll. I uh, hopefully like to think they'll have a really enjoyable experience with us. And those that don't, okay, then they might have to be a different path in that instance. But so far, the players have been excellent. And we've seen the players out there doing double sessions, a session in the morning, a session sometimes in the afternoon. What's the thinking behind those sessions and how do they sort of work? Would you have one sort of fitness based, one ball work? Just explain the dynamic of those a little bit. Every, every day has a different dynamic within the schedule. So um, we sort of have a, a larger scale plan, obviously, for the whole of pre-season. Um, and then we have the smaller scale plan of week by week, day by day. Um, and of course it's subject to change because um, we are big on feeling the energy of the group and uh, do we need to accelerate and can we push the accelerator now and up the level of demands or do we need to come off them now because that session we pitched a little bit too high or they didn't quite respond how we thought they would. We thought they'd find that easier. Actually, they found it really tough. So, okay, tomorrow we might have to adapt. But in terms of the, the, the double sessions and they'll continue Again, maybe the players won't want to hear this, but they'll continue throughout the whole season. It's not just, OK, of course, at the moment, there's a different nature of work in terms of the physical side of things. But um, we're huge on the, the mentality, the culture. Um, and the only way to achieve that is to is for all of us to understand we have to work and we have to work hard. Um, that's what we're paid to do. And if we want to be the best team that we can be, not just a good team, if we want to be a great team, which is the, the vision of this manager. Um, unfortunately, the only way to do that is to work, is to be out on the training pitch, is to push ourselves to levels that we've never been to, um, to be open, which is what, something we demand of the players, like be open to our way of working. Um, it, it might be different. It might be more demanding than you faced in the past. There's always a natural phase that you go through where there can be moans, there can be groans. Oh, this is hard, that's hard. Um, but hopefully eventually, because of how we feel it's planned correctly, it's never dangerous. Um, and they'll get to a point where it just becomes habit and they won't be moaning anymore. They'll just be like, they'll be demanding the hard work themselves. Well, that's the idea. It sounds <laughs> like you have to be very adaptable. As you say, you know, if you pitch something too high or you want something to be at a, a higher intensity, it certainly sounds like you have to, you know, be able to adapt to the situation. Yeah, you have to be, you have to be uh, world-class in your prescription of the work. As I said before, when to push, when to ease, um, and the only way you can achieve that is if every department at the club, not just the coaching department, um, our job coming in as six members of staff to a new environment with a lot of existing staff around us, we have to 
transmit our beliefs, our cultures, our behaviors to them and make it real clear so that they can help us achieve that and we can work as one team again back to that no gaps in the program um, and I think if the medical team the sports science team the doctors if we're all working in that way and we all share the same mentality and we're all aligned and it's a cohesive program then you should be able to deliver really really difficult hard work in terms of how you pitch it to the players but keep players out of the treatment room and on the pitch at the same time and and that's that's the task, that's where we need to do our jobs well. And it's a fairly young squad that we've got here at the moment. As a young coaching staff, does that help you have a relationship with them? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say so. I, I'm always a big believer that the player, you need to be credible. You need to, in, in your own way, everyone, there's, there's no blueprint for, oh, you need to behave like this as a coach. You need to, everyone's different. I think probably point number one is be authentic, be yourself, you can't act. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily say it's anything to, to do with age. If anything, I'd say perhaps I'm a little bit older now, but when I was coaching, when I was 22, I was coaching players that were 20, 21 years old. It was difficult then because, but in the other way, because you have to, you want to try and create a distance from the players and maybe the natural disposition of you coaching someone around your same age is you can become close. Um, but again, I don't think, that, I think it's how you, how you build your relationship and then how you use that relationship to ultimately improve the player and improve the team. And that's hopefully something we can do here. On a serious note about the, the human interest, you've spoken about your fiance there and uh, I don't know where you live and, and, and stuff like that, but th there's an upheaval with mm. moving clubs. Just tell us w what that's been like for you. Yeah, it's probably my first real experience of it. Obviously I went from um, previous to, I suppose I experienced a little bit before, but previous to um, my first job in coaching, I went, I was, I went to America and did four months out there, which was a, an incredible experience. Came back, and at the time I lived in a place in Hertfordshire, and then I got a job at Stevenage, so a 15, 20 minute commute, perfect. Um, at the end of that year, I went to the Nike Academy, which was then at the time based at Loughborough University, so. Uh, I experienced moving away then, so I used to stay residentially up at Loughborough University. Um, and I think that was a really good experience at uh, a youngish age of, of living away from home and probably helps build your independence. Uh, then got the call from Tottenham that they'd like me to come and take up a full-time coaching role at Spurs, which was back to being 15 minutes from where I lived. Um, and then moved to Fulham, which was an hour and 15 drive in the morning so perfectly manageable uh, and now obviously Bournemouth um, which is probably well definitely for me I'm not not great at getting up early in the mornings or any earlier than I need to so um, it's, it's not manageable for me in terms of a drive so uh, and I think it's important wherever you go is, is to be fully invested and so um, at the right time when we get a chance to breathe uh, I'll definitely try and uh, make the move permanent here to Bournemouth and then of course you have discussions with with my fiance as it is and uh, at the t at this moment we're perhaps lucky not to have kids at this moment I think that makes it a little bit easier for me than p perhaps some of the other lads who, who have got bigger families um, so my main commitment is obviously Lauren and I think she's just delighted that that we're here that we're happy and uh, she's really excited that, as am I. Brilliant just going back on that hard work the, the work ethic that you are instilling here um you know when you go back years i know my dad always used to laugh oh you know footballers they only train for half an hour a day and then they're off down the pub all the bookies and all that things have changed so mm -hmm. much it is now a full-time job monday to friday and saturday if you like yeah listen it's all encompassing uh, and i think that's the the way it, it has to be really again i can't speak for any other regime i think every every manager has different ways of uh, of managing the team of 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 scheduling and you hear a lot of success stories of teams that have won leagues by having days off midweek and uh, perhaps building the culture that way. So I think again, it comes back to authenticity and you can only um, work in the way you believe uh, achieve success. And um, with this manager, um, his belief is no, we always need to do more. Uh, we always need to train more. We always need to work harder. We always need to do more in the gym. We always need to do more video analysis. Um, and that's just, I guess, rubbed off on us as a staff. 
um, and that then becomes the program that we deliver and the messages that we deliver to the players. Um, so I think it, it, it might be difficult for them initially. We, we fully expect that. Um, but we just believe that's the way it has to be. And especially, as I said, to certainly through pre-season, although to a fan, I think when they know pre-season has started to our first fixture, say against West Brom, that seems like a really long stretch of time for the fans. I'm sure they they just can't wait to get going. Whereas for us, it feels like, cool, that's a short space of time to deliver what we need to deliver. Um, and we won't be able to achieve it in that time. We just have to make sure that come that first game, we're, we're a very, very good team. And then throughout the season, we need to work to become a great team. More content for the club website? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there will be as time goes on. <laughs> Just tell us about um, Emilio Marcondes, the first signing of the Scott Parker era. And the manager spoke yesterday about, made reference to a game a couple of seasons ago where he came off the bench and yeah. um, did very well for Brentford, set one up and scored one. Just, just tell us about him. Yeah, it's a really, really exciting acquisition, I think, for us um, as, as a club because... Uh, as, you, as you mentioned there, I know the gaffer, us as a staff, we used to we used to discuss Emiliano uh, in the office whenever we were playing Brentford. He was actually a player that we didn't want on the team sheet. Um, and I think that, that game, we were actually relieved that he wasn't starting. And then unfortunately, he came off the bench and um, yeah, had a huge impact on, on them winning the game. Um, up until then, we were probably the, the, the dominant side. So we're well aware of, of Emiliano's uh, qualities and... And now this period will be really important for him uh, to get to know us, for us to get to know him on a much deeper level um, as both a person and as a player. Because I think we all know as managers and coaches, there's always certain players that you are attracted to when they play for the other team. And then you coach them yourselves and work with them and they have to fit, he has to fit within our game model and he'll have to deliver uh, the aspects of the game that we want him to deliver, which I'm sure he will. He seems like a really, really good guy. Um, with a really impressive work rate. Um, uh, Joe Achim Anderson, who we coached uh, at Fulham, um, is very good friends with him. So we always used to discuss him. And since Emiliano's come in, we've discussed Joa. Um, so we have a little bit of a, a, a connection there, which is good. Um, but he's a really, really exciting signing and, and I hope he can do great things for the club. What about the personality behind the player? You said you know all about his playing style, etc., but you probably didn't know him. Um, how much work goes into finding out about a player off the pitch, if you like? Yeah, I think it. For me, that's that, that's fundamental. I think we're, with all the players over over time, you have to you have to get to know them as a as a person, and I think always treat the the person first and the and the player second, and I think that makes you a better coach. So. Uh, we won't know how to really get our messages across to Emiliano in the most effective manner until we know him as a person and we know what makes him tick. Uh, we know what his motivations are. And once once we know that, we can understand on a lot deeper sense how to coach him, how to get our messages across. And I think that's where probably the gaffer specialises. He's was certainly a lot better than me on that side of things of, of understanding what makes people tick and how to tap into their motivations and how to convince them um, to, to go on the journey that he wants them to go on. So I'll probably leave the majority of that side to, to him. Um, but I think it's really important as a staff that we know all the players inside out. I, I'm just going to throw one in there about that because we've, we've asked Scott about um, Harry Arter and playing under, playing Harry playing for him. As a, as a sort of non-family member, what, what was that dynamic like between brother-in-laws, if you like? It was the same as obviously if you didn't know that Harry was was the, the manager's brother-in-law, you would assume it was the same as any other player. Um, I think sometimes Harry had frustrations that he was sat on the bench um, and there was other players playing in front of him. But that's the way it has to be. As I say, it's, it's sort of culture precedes performance in, in the manager's mind. And um, so, of course, it has to be that every player plays on merit. I think whenever a player signs here, we're... As a staff, we're all, we're all aligned in our thinking that, say, a player, when the player will sign for Bournemouth um, under our, our regime and the manager's regime, they're, they're signing to train. They're not signing to play. And it's then how they train, uh, the culture, the behaviours they show, their willingness to work um, that gets them in the team. So 
Um, Harry, Harry was no different. And I'm sure deep down, Harry would want it that way as well because he's such a top person. Um, so I think it was, I'm sure there were some interesting dinner times around the, the family table that I wasn't privy to, but yeah, especially when he was on the bench. <laughs> Looking ahead to to the next few weeks, we've got this uh, pre this preseason trip to Spain. How much are you looking forward to that, and what can the lads expect? We're really looking forward to it. I think more, even more so than I always look forward to um, to the preseason trips because it's probably where your work intensifies a little bit in terms of the detail. Um, so at the moment, uh, say the first two weeks training here at the training grounds is more. Certainly uh, giving the players a physical base, um, trying to get, get them to a point where they can tolerate all the work we're going to give them physically. And from a tactical standpoint, things at the moment kept pretty global. Um, so I zoomed out in terms of the detail, um, the general framework of how we're going to play, trying to get the players to first understand into that, trying to outline some principles um, that they're going to need to adhere to. And then once we get to Spain, um, because uh, we're so close together with with each other day and night. It gives you, it buys you just more time in the schedule to do more work in the video room. Obviously here you're conscious, you don't want to keep players here till 8, 9 p.m. in the evening. Whereas once we get to Spain, we'll be able to do double sessions of football on the pitch, a, a session then in the gym. And then guess what? We can still pepper them with some video in the evening. So I think just the learning accelerates. I think it also gives a platform, as we discussed before, to really get to know the players uh, on an individual level, to maybe see them in um, different settings if we do some little team games around the hotel. And um, I think we can start to sort of um, blend the team in the way we want to. And I definitely think by the end of the trip, we'll understand the players a lot better and they'll have a much greater understanding of, of our expectations of them. You mentioned a couple of things there that I just wanted to ask you on the video aspect of things how important is that to you and and the staff because obviously we see you guys out there there's a drone every now and then flowing above the training ground and for you guys how crucial are those sessions and how important is it to look back and assess and show the players what you want them to achieve using that yeah in terms of in terms of the learning cycle it's 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 just something we we swear by um it's not to say it's necessarily right i'm sure other regimes potentially do do less work in in the video room, but but for us it's yeah it's huge and it's I would say in terms of um, how we divide the, the the video side of our program, the majority is based around um, feedback of of how we train and how we play, as opposed to um, opposition based analysis, which of course we do. Um, but in terms of is it, the message is always, and that's going to be the mentality of the manager's team here, uh, as that's the way he operates, that we have to be the proactive team in every game. We're the dominant team. And of course, that means being aware of the opponent. Um, but it's it's generally about us imposing our way of defending, our way of attacking on, on the opponent. And to achieve that, of course, you have your time on the training pitch. Um, but if you were to stop and correct everything that was wrong on the training pitch, you'd be out there for five hours. So a lot of then our, our real detail coaching needs to be, as you say, off the drone, in the classroom in the afternoon, get the units up, get individuals up, do it as a team, depending on what the subject is. But it might just be one or two players then in the video room, showing them clips of the defensive line. Uh, as an example, helping Lloyd Kelly with a correction. Oh, look at Lloyd, your body shape here. This is good. This is bad. This is what we need. Um, and that process will, will exist for all of the players around the fundamentals of the game that we're going to try and deliver. So um, it's a very video heavy program. And I think I think also every player learns differently. So it's the more we get to know them, the more we'll get to understand right which player really responds to that, which player some players can't quite make the translation between seeing it on the screen and then going out to the pitch. Some people make that connection really quickly. Other players need to be stood in their position on the football pitch, have it talked through, show them, let them practice it. So everyone learns in different ways and we just try to hit as many as those learning styles as we can. Another thing that you mentioned and you mentioned it again there is getting to know the players and getting that relationship with them so that they can implement the style that you want. 
when you go away to Spain, as as you say, it provides a brilliant opportunity for you and the staff to get to know these players. Is that as important as the footballing side of things? So that when you do go in the classroom and, and show them things, it you know really helps stick in their head the philosophy that you're trying to, to prove? Yeah, I think they're both sort of intrinsically linked that you can't have one without the other. So I think for us to get to know the players is important. If you ask me now, oh, how's so-and-so going to respond when they're one nil down away from home? I really couldn't tell you uh, an answer because you don't get to, I well, don't know the players' characters um, as well as we would like to just yet, simply because of time constraints. We've not been here long enough. And um, until players experience those moments and we get to witness it, um, within the confines of how we play. Of course, we've all uh, spent numerous hours studying video of the last couple of years of how the team plays, how players play, um, so that we have uh, s at least some degree of knowledge of, of how these players operate. But there really is no substitute for, for witnessing it yourself. And uh, the longer, the more time we spend with these players, the more we're going to have an understanding of of how they respond in adversity, how are they, how do they operate when they're having a little period of success? Um, I think we all know the rigors of the championship, um, how demanding the schedule is, and so, um, and and we know what this, what our manager is about. That the mentality comes first, and um, that's the only way you can create a successful team. And we need to develop almost a, a robot-like mentality that whether we're winning, whether we're losing, we operate at our maximal intensity every time. And just finally, one thing I have to ask you about, yeah. given it's so topical at the moment, the Euros, how I impressed... We say Love Island. <laughs> well, we can talk <laughs> about Love Island if you want, but I think we might no, lose a few, few listeners at this yeah. point. Um, the Euros, how impressed have you been with England and, and the job Gareth Southgate's doing? They've really united a country after a, a tough 18 months, haven't they? Yeah, I think probably the way... One, probably one of the downsides of coaching and being in the industry you're in is you can, as I said before, you can never really switch off. So... I do actually sometimes miss watching football as a fan, um, where I'm not focused on what movements are they making or how are the other team pressing, where's the spare man? Um, and you can just relax and watch it. I've still not managed to be able to do that. So from from a coaching perspective and a management perspective, I've been so impressed with, with the job that um, Gareth's done uh, and I'm sure his staff as well. So I've not obviously managed to see behind the scenes uh, the intricacies of how they work, but I certainly think in 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 some of the uh, selections that he's made, in some of the the tactical tweaks that he's made, I've, I've been really really impressed with the courage of his convictions. I think he's made some really big calls um, that perhaps pundits uh, and fans were questioning before he made them. And I think he even said after one of the games, "Core, if, if I'd have got that wrong, I'd have been in trouble." And and that is the the nature of football. It can be quite fickle, um, but from a from a coaching side of things, I've admired the way he's, he's gone about it, how adaptable he's been, how they've managed to seek advantage in each game through their tactical changes. Um, and as I say, through making really, really big decisions. So I just hope that they can finish the job well. So I've learned about TikTok in the last few weeks. Is Love Island, is that another social media channel? <laughs> or don't know anything about that, Zoe. What's that all about? Don't worry, Neil. I'll, uh, I'll fill you in over the next few weeks and you'll be all up to date by the time the final's here. I can't wait. Um, so tell us, Scott knows the area quite well because he used to come down and watch Harry Arter from time to time. What about you? Have you had a chance to get out there and have a look around? I've really not. We're staying in the hotel, so I've managed to have... Um, obviously, we're, we're getting home quite late because, uh, as I say, we're doing double sessions, then we're having staff meetings, and then we're doing a lot of... The video continues in terms of you know, we're still watching games from last season and um, so not tending to get back to the hotel until really late but I've had a few a few nice walks around been down to the beach so no, it seems like a it seems like a beautiful area um, my fiance was down actually for the last couple of nights and uh, she, I think she's seen more than I have unfortunately so she's telling me about different areas that that she went to and visited so I'm sure when we when we get a rare day off I'll, I'll go and have a venture around West Brom at home, first game. How have you started preparing for that already? Can you can you in advance, so in advance, if you like? Uh, I think it depends what you class as preparation. If if preparation is um, laying the foundations for the way we're going to play, then of course we've we've started preparing. In terms of uh, specifically watching games of West Brom, of course they've had a change of manager. 
as well. So it, I think for both teams, it's going to be a really difficult one to to prepare for and hang their hat on exactly how each team's going to play. Um, so I think for us, the best preparation, and that will continue throughout the season, is what are we going to do? Uh, and we need to deliver the best version of ourselves. So of course, we've started that preparation already, and that will continue right through pre-season. It will intensify in Spain, as I said. Um, but it's it's a fixture that uh, we can't wait for. We're really excited for, um, especially given that it's, a, it's at home and it's in front of the fans. Um, so we're really excited for that. You've got promoted out of the championship. What What's the secret? <laughs> I don't think anyone can can say for sure. I think there's there's certain fundamentals that you have to have in this division. Um, and, and for us as a staff, it starts with mentality. It starts with um, being able to um, cope with the, the, the demanding scheduling um, to play Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Friday night. Um, the games come thick and fast um, and there'll always be periods of, of adversity and, and, and that will happen again this season. It will happen for every team. So I always think the, the teams that succeed will be the ones that manage those periods the best. Um, and that's never luck. That's never just... Um, Oh, fortunately, we managed to come through that period. It all comes down to the foundations that we're laying now. I think the gaffer's always big on that, the foundations of of, of how we work. And that's what pre-season is, is fundamental for because no one ever sees the foundations. I just bought a new house and no, I can't see the foundations that have been laid underneath the floor. And that's sort of how I see and how we see uh, a team operating that we need real, real solid foundations. And that's what... We're trying to transmit to the players now with the way we work, with the double sessions, with the intensity that we're demanding, with the standards that we're demanding, uh, both on and off the pitch, with us filming how they behave in the gym, highlighting body language, the, 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 the tiny details that the manager's huge on. And we hope that contributes to creating a team with a, a strong mentality that can cope with uh, the, the schedule of the championship. Well, Matt, I think I speak on behalf of myself Neil and all the fans to say that it's been an absolutely brilliant insight to have you here on the podcast have you enjoyed it because I've you enjoyed said it <laughs> you've never done anything like this before. yeah no we've never I've never done any podcasts obviously done the the media stuff and um no, I think it's it's brilliant as I, I said to you guys before just before we came on air that um especially now with the journey as well uh, I end up listening to a lot of podcasts especially the high performance podcast I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do that is that free advertising but um high performance podcasts and other good podcasts um in my journey so I uh, know I hope I hope the fans get something from this and uh, I think it's brilliant for them to have a small insight into into what the manager demands and and how we operate and if you want to do it again I'm I'd be more than happy now then, if you've enjoyed listening in today, please make sure you give us a five-star rating on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you're listening. We'd love it even more as well if you could share it on social media so that more fans can tune in. Our thanks again to Matt Wells and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle. Thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. <laughs>